Greetings comrades, today we are going to talk about unfairness. For example, was it fair that the US hid its military innovations from their main allies in the World War II, the Soviet Union? After all, if the United States had shared them, the war could have ended much earlier. That's what our two today's heroes believed, and that's why, soon after the war, the comprehensive assistance to USSR became their number one priority. However, this is how they are remembered in the USSR. In the US, they are spoken of differently. They are remembered as the only members of the famous Julius and Ethel Rosenberg spy group, who managed to escape punishment. The same group which supposedly gave all the secrets of the atomic bomb to the USSR. And here are their names, Joel Barr and Alfred Surround. And for more than 30 years after their escape from the US, they diligently worked for the benefit of the Soviet Union. Do you think they went down in history as the people who helped to create the Soviet atomic bomb? No, no, not at all. They are remembered as the people who created the Soviet Silicon Valley. So, how did it happen that two Americans escaped to the USSR from the United States, taking more than 9,000 secret documents with them, and then managed to raise an entire industry from the ground up in the Soviet country? It all began with the fact that they were devout communists, convinced of the inevitability of a socialist revolution in the United States. Basically, like almost all of the Rosenberg group. So, let's talk about them. The Great and Terrible Atomic Spies. So, what is this group led by Julius and Ethel Rosenberg famous for? At the very least, they were the only civilians executed in the US for espionage during the Cold War. So, what exactly were these terrible things they handed over to the USSR that got them such a harsh punishment? In fact, there is still no consensus as to whether the Rosenbergs passed anything of real value to the USSR. More precisely, it is known that their group handed over more than 32,000 documents to the Soviets, 9,000 of which our today's heroes are personally responsible for. But the main charges from the US side were based on the fact that the Rosenbergs actually handed the USSR some key secret of making the nuclear bomb. The Soviet Union of course denies it, saying that the country's best minds designed it themselves, and there were no bomb blueprints at all in the Rosenberg documents. In fact, the truth, as always, is somewhere in the middle. From the documents declassified after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it is clear that Julius Rosenberg was indeed a Soviet spy and had been collecting various information about US military developments for several years. But there is a problem. His group consisted of almost 20 people, but none of them had actual access to the blueprints of the atomic bomb, and could not have. The Rosenbergs were able to pass on only one actually unique to military engineers working on nuclear weapons piece of information. The fuse diagram for the bomb dropped on Nagasaki, Japan. And most of the documents handed over by Rosenbergs were related to chemistry and radio location. The main data on the atomic bomb was given to the Soviet Union by Klaus Fuchs, an official participant in the Manhattan Project and an ardent communist, convinced that the atomic bomb should not belong only to the Western world. The balance, as he said, must exist. Except that Fuchs lived in the UK, and so he received only 14 years in prison for his deed of which he served nine. The Rosenbergs, on the other hand, were unlucky enough to spy from the most democratic country in the world. Even without passing anything critical, they still earned the death penalty. Other people associated with the Rosenbergs received various prison sentences. All but two. When Alfred Surrand was invited for questioning by the FBI, he didn't think for a second, but fled to Mexico with his neighbor Carol, who had left her husband and children behind. They reached Mexico City after two months of traveling and realized that there was no way back for them. After contacting Soviet agents, they managed to escape via Guatemala by cargo ship to Morocco, then to Spain and from there by plane to Poland. After six months, the couple made it to Moscow. Soon, they began their new lives. 
new documents, names and biographies. This is how Soviet citizens Filip Georgievich Staras and Anna Petrovna Staras appeared. At the same time, Joel Barr also arrived in Moscow. Or more precisely now, Iosif Vinyaminovich Berg. This is where their tandem was formed. The union of two unusually gifted engineers. Americans who managed to make a splendid career in the USSR. However, Barr and Sarant, and now Berg and Staras, did not stay in Moscow in 1950, but went to Prague for six years. They were assigned to work at the Institute of Military Engineering, where they worked on the development of fire control systems and participated in the creation of the first Czechoslovak analog computer. It was only in 1956 that the comrades returned to Leningrad and became heads of a special laboratory, where they began to work on the development and implementation of microelectronic technology in USSR. You know, there is an opinion that Berg and Staras literally brought all the latest achievements of American microelectronics to the USSR, but this is simply not true. We cannot overestimate the impact of these two certainly talented people, but they both quit working in this field even before the invention of the transistor in 1948, and were just ordinary engineers back at home. In the USSR, the first germanium transistor was made in 1949, and at the same time it was already put into full-scale production. That is, it would be wrong to call Bergen Staros the fathers of all microelectronics in the USSR. But their role should also not be underestimated. Of course, all the developments of the USSR in this area were strictly classified, so all the data became available to the general public only after 1991. As it turned out, the cradle of Soviet microelectronics was the Special Design Bureau No. 2, located in the city of Leningrad. It should be noted that when Barr and Sarant first escaped from the United States, they were welcomed in Moscow, along with some members from the KGB, by Nikita Khrushchev, then first secretary of the Moscow Regional Committee of the VKPB, CPSU. He advised to send them to Prague, and then, having become first secretary of the Central Committee of the CPSU, he returned them to Moscow. Apparently, that first meeting really made an impression on him because he immediately gave the Americans their own laboratory. At first, laboratory with the codename SL-11 totaled no more than 30 workers and was located somewhere in the attic of one of the Leningrad Scientific Research Institutes. Later, by 1961, a separate design bureau of electronic engineering was established on the base of that specific laboratory, KB-2. Filip Georgievich Staras was appointed as its head and Iosif Yaminovich Berg as his deputy and chief engineer. According to recollections of contemporaries, they really differed from most typical Soviet administrators of that time, at least by the fact that they possessed really extensive knowledge in their field, and were not just put in charge through their connections. It was KB2 that quickly took the first place among enterprises of electronic industry. It was here that the first integrated circuits were produced in the USSR, the first mini-computer UM1 and Ash and the first Soviet microcalculator C315 were developed there. In 1962, Nikita Khrushchev himself visited the institute and was absolutely thrilled when the smallest radio receiver in the world, ERA, was inserted into his ear. By the way, they also showed him the UM1 and Ash mini-computer. The problem is that at that time it was not really a desktop computer yet. They just put the main block of the computer on the table, in front of Khrushchev, and hid the other two blocks from his eyes. Nikita Khrushchev was a very keen man, so immediately after this event he decided, we need to turn the satellite city of Zelenograd, then under construction near Moscow, which was to become the center of light industry, into the center of microelectronics. And Sarant was quickly appointed as a deputy head of the center. Just imagine, one word, and the whole city completely changes its purpose in one moment. Said and done. The decree of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the USSR Council of Ministers was signed on August 8, 1962. It prescribed to create a center of microelectronics, consisting of several institutes and pilot plants, providing a closed cycle of development and production of integrated circuits. 
The first research institutes, mechanical engineering and microcircuitry, were organized on temporary sites in the premises of typical college buildings and boarding schools. The same ones that a few months ago were reserved for future light industry professionals. However, do not be surprised, this was not something unusual for the USSR. Back in the 50s, for example, in the city of Tula, ordinary car repair shops were converted into a factory for the production of ground artillery reconnaissance radar stations. Or in 1957, a garment factory in Nizhevsk was quickly converted into a factory producing guidance equipment for air-to-air -air missiles. However, the reprofiling of an entire city had never taken place in the Soviet Union before 1962. Although the experience of rapid creation of single industry towns for various scientific problems was, of course, already there, I have talked about it in my video about Naukagrads. The construction was also spurred by the international situation, the Cuban Missile Crisis which broke out in the late 1962. Therefore, five main research institutes were built already in 1963, and by 1971 there were up to 13,000 scientists working in the center. In 1963, the first in the USSR mass product of microelectronics, a radio receiver called Micro, was produced. It was assembled using thin film hybrid technology. The size of the receiver was 43 by 30 by 7.5 mm. By the way, despite the fact that the first real product of the Zelenograd Center was a micro radio receiver, the same idea of Sarant that impressed Khrushchev, Sarant and Barr themselves gradually began to withdraw from the leadership of the center. As I said, one should not overestimate their influence. Sarant quickly realized that the center was not what he wanted it to be. He had never been particularly interested in microchips per se. According to his former employees, he had every opportunity to create the world's first hybrid integrated circuit in 1958-1959, but was not too interested in the idea. Sarant dreamed of creating and leading a giant company, modeled on America's Bell Laboratories, but a hundred times larger, surpassing anything existing or being created in the West, to build and produce onboard computers. But the country needed not only computers, but also many other electronic products, often even more important than computers at that time. That is why Zelenograd became the center for production of integrated circuits as a commodity product, a unified element base for all electronics while Sarant and Barr dreamed of something else. As a result, a few years later they left Zelenograd, again focusing on work in KB2. Zelenograd continued to live and develop without them. It should be emphasized that the creation of the microelectronic center in Zelenograd was not an isolated effort, but part of a large-scale program for building a new sub-industry, microelectronics. Reprofiling of existing research institutes or creation of new ones took place throughout the whole Union. Zelenograd was only a part of a huge iceberg, its tip. In fact, a whole industry was created in the USSR in just a few years, which allowed the USSR for some time to confidently stay in top 3 microelectronic countries, after the USA and Japan. So why haven't they been able to develop this success? It's no secret that all the successes in the field of computer development in the USSR can be only characterized as local. In my video about the reasons for the collapse of the USSR, I even highlighted this as a separate problem. Everything that was developed in the last years of the USSR was in one way or another related to military industry. Microelectronics had not escaped this fate. Microcircuits for the cruise missiles have been successfully created, but for the desktop PCs, not really. But there is another explanation for all of this, in addition to a huge focus on the military-industrial complex. The electronic industry of Europe, the USA, Japan, no matter how fierce the competition between the individual companies was, had been developing under conditions of a constant exchange of achievements from the international trading licenses and patents, documentation of technological processes, the newest control measuring optical and mechanical equipment, materials, etc. The electronic industry of our country was completely deprived of such an opportunity. Everything had to be done from scratch and independently. Nevertheless, up to the end of the 1970s, the use of some microelectronics was almost on par with the US, lagging behind only in the field of semiconductor ICs. In general, even the first Soviet experimental personal computer, Electronica NC8010, was released only a couple of years later than its American counterpart but the difference in financial capabilities should also not be overlooked. 
For example, the USSR developed its first own semiconductor chip ICR-12-2 and the quant module almost simultaneously with the USA. But the Americans immediately launched mass production, forming more and more new companies, now world famous for this purpose, creating fundamentally new materials and equipment. Seeing the obvious prospects, they spared no expenses and proved to be right. And in the USSR, in a planned economy, and with the special role of the individuals in it, it was not so easy to organize fundamentally new enterprises and develop fundamentally new products. The highest support from the heads of state was required. Many high-ranking officials had to be convinced of the necessity to invest huge sums of money into an undertaking which was not obvious in its practical usefulness, a task which was almost hopeless. Khrushchev fell in love with microelectronics and provided such resources. The next leaders of the party did not share his passion. As a result, by the start of the 1980s, the USSR was far behind both the foreign level and the needs of the country in terms of production volumes of integrated circuits. A huge problem for the USSR was also the fact that the transition to the next generation of microcircuits required replacement of almost all equipment with the new one every three to five years. And since almost all of the spending on microelectronics in the USSR went to the military industry to create large computing complexes, the lack quickly became catastrophic in personal computers and consumer electronics. The Soviet legacy of chronic lagging behind in electronics was automatically passed on from the USSR to Russia. Unfortunately, despite some successful developments in these areas, the situation has never gotten any better after 30 years. Even worse, because absolutely all production chains were broken. Some factories and research institutes for the production of components remained in the Baltics, some in Ukraine, some in Russia. Only in 2019, the Zelenograd Enterprise Micron, one of those very first research institutes that appeared in 1962, produced the first Russian microchips made according to the 65 nanometer process. Let me remind you that this is the level of a glorious Pentium 4 processor, which was produced in 2006. Well, let's hope that the new economic reality will somehow manage to spur the process of technology development in Russia, as it happened to the USSR in the early 1960s.